Okay, let's get this party started. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name's Rianne Edwards. I'm the Chief Exec of the Hospice of Good Shepherd, which is located just outside Chester and covers North East Wales. Um, you're very welcome. If anybody's interested, Japan have just had a goal disallowed against Germany. So, um, uh, this afternoon's session um, is being live recorded. It will be available, as been said, on the other sessions in about 10 days' time. Um, for those that you wish to ask questions, you can do it through um, the app. For those that are on the live screen, they will come through on the chat and I should be able to filter them through. Um, we'll ask questions at the end of the session to allow all of these eminent speakers the opportunity to have their time with you. Um, I'm joined today by Professor Jonathan Kaufman, um, Dr. Gemma Clark, and Dr. Zobia Islam. So um, I'm sure you'll make them feel very welcome. Um, the, um, the Slido app, as I said, um, is available for people to use. Um, at the end of the session, um, which is due to finish at 14.45, please do make your way back through to the exhibitors room because I'm sure you've seen lots of the stands, but they are there and they're the people that help funding the conference. So with no further ado, I will hand over to Professor Jonathan. Thank you very much indeed and good afternoon everyone. Um, I just want to, pre to present a few slides just to put the context of what we're going to be talking about um, in order for the rest of the afternoon. Um, numbers, big numbers. These are numbers which are almost incalculable, but they represent people who are moving from low to middle income countries, largely to Australia, to Europe, to North America, to the United Kingdom. And each of these people, 80.5 million people, potentially represents a candidate for an individual who might be living with a life-limiting condition or the families who surround them. And each of these individuals potentially comes with a very different repertoire for how they make sense of illness or symptoms, their illness behaviours, how they've related to health services, how they conceptualise and make sense of some of the most important moments in their lives. For example, living with a life-limiting condition and dying from it and also for the family members who surround them in terms of how they conceptualise grief, which we know is socially patterned and channelled. And then we get on to the real people. Those numbers don't really help us understand the agendas, the lived experiences of all these folk. And they've become highly politicised, but they are people with a narrative, people who fill up planes, people who travel on very fragile dinghies across the channel, individuals like this little girl in the corner. I have spent a career working on marginalised communities, people from ethnically diverse communities, and my work has revealed a number of inconvenient truths in relation to the reality that people from minoritised communities are often disenchanted with the care that they receive at the end of life, dissatisfied with the manner in which they have received care from services which include palliative care. They're often excluded from very important conversations about where they want to spend their last few days and where they would want to die. They're not included in very important conversations about advanced care planning and so on. And much of my work was shaped at a very important moment in time as a result of Stephen Lawrence, a chap who died in South East London, and as a result of that we had the McPherson Report, which was pivotal in moving blame from the individual in terms of racism to systemic and structural racism. And this was really pivotal in helping me understand how services might need to reconsider the manner in which they were caring for people at their most vulnerable moment. The problem is, I'm not sure if I've made any difference at all, and I'm not sure whether the work that I had done has been constructed in the most appropriate way, and I'll get on to that. So then we had this really important existential moment in time. Firstly, 
we have the very interesting movements in with the tectonic plates of the ethnocultural landscape. We had Black Lives Matters. We had the reality of Empire Windrush, where people who came here in the late 1940s and 50s to work in the United Kingdom from the West Indies were told after several decades of living this country, of paying tax, of putting their children through the schooling system, that they weren't British and they had to leave really quickly. And that led to the resignation of Amber Rudd. We had the murder of George Floyd. And then, of course, we had the reality that people from minoritized communities were, became excellent candidates for COVID, largely as a result of the fact that they were frontline workers who had no access to PPE, or they were living in multi-generational housing as a consequence of poverty. We spoke about this this morning in Sam Royston's session. And this was a really important moment for us because I was doing work with Sabrina Bajwa and Jamila Hussein. We both spoke, spoke with them last year, which raised the very important narrative that we understood from services during the pandemic, but they were offering an equal service to people from black, Asian and ethnically diverse communities at the end of life and their relatives. And what we came to the conclusion was that equal is not commensurate with equitable. And there were people from minoritized communities who were getting a very disenfranchised service. And as a consequence of this work, we were invited to write an editorial for Palliative Medicine where we really put our heads up of the parapets and made the claim that palliative care was racist. Inadvertently so, but nevertheless racist. And this got me thinking in relation to one of the recommendations that we made, that we needed better data, that we needed to do better research in order to understand the needs of minoritized communities and so importantly, develop solutions that would make a difference to these individuals in terms of adding health gain, adding life, years to life and life to years. So when an opportunity, and I think this is a really important statement, I love this, this particular phrase by Ella Willowcox, that to sin by silence when we should protest makes cowards out of men. I think we had been silent for too long in relation to how we were delivering services, but also in relation to how we were doing research, which could be done differently. And when an opportunity came along from Paris of Medicine for their equity issue, I felt this was an ideal moment to conduct an autopsy in relation to how palliative care research had been constructed over the last period, and also to reflect on the work that I had done over the last 20 years as well. Great people here, enticing opportunity, and we wrote a narrative systematic review, where, as I said, we conducted an autopsy using a knife and fork to dissect the manner in which research had been conducted over a period of time in relation to several important questions. How were research questions being constructed in relation to focusing on minoritized communities? How was the methodology contrived? How were we reporting those findings with precision and very importantly, with respect? All of those questions were addressed in the review. And this is free to download from that wonderful journal, Path of Medicine. So what did we find? We found from the 109 articles that we reviewed, a good deal of what I would refer to as conceptual sloppiness, a total lack of precision in relation to how very important terms, for example, ethnicity and race and culture were used and operationalized within research. They were often used interchangeably or often conflated with other social metrics, for example, social classes, education. We wouldn't do that if we were focusing on a particular clinical syndrome, for example, neuropathic pain. We have definitions for how we understand those terms. But when we use terms like ethnicity and race, it becomes a conceptual mess. So, very quickly, I do not like the concept of race. It has a long and inglorious history. It's frequently used in the American literature, but it relies on an assumption that there are 
significant and important biological differences between people, which I would regard as being important in their own right in terms of how people from different groups may metabolize drugs in different ways. But many of those traits are inconsequential. I would argue that there's currency in relation to race when we see it as a way of maintaining power balances between people with white people invariably at the top and others below that. It's rooted in social Darwinism. It has no place in current research. We move on to a term which is much better attuned to understanding differences that make a difference. And it's here again that ethnicity is often operationalized with a wanton lack of precision. I argue it has two dimensions. The attributional dimension, which I've presented here, which is represented by culture and folklores and traditions that are maintained between generations. And also, very importantly, a relational dimension, the position of that group or that individual within the wider society. Culture, I argue, is our recipe for living in the world, which is comprised of multiple ingredients which we inherit over time and sometimes we dispense with. So when it comes to identity and the manner in which identity is operationalized in palliative care literature, you can see here that there is a certain element of imprecision in terms of what does white mean? Caucasian I have a real issue with because it goes back to Blumenbach who discovered Karl skulls in the Caucasus Mountains where those skulls were associated with a lofty mentality than skulls that he identified on the African subcontinent. But I am also guilty of this in relation to how I've made use of terms by grouping a whole continent of people, let's say white people from Europe and the United Kingdom in a single category. And that means that we lose the nuances that are very important between groups of individuals and people. And you can see here that we often make use of the Asian category as a term for understanding differences between Asian people, people from the African subcontinent and white people. And on the face of it, it's meaningless. And yet we perpetuate this within the literature. A way of getting around this is making use of the classification for the Office of National Statistics. And on the right hand side of the screen, this is the American classification. And from 1991, where ethnicity was first rolled out as being a requirement within the census, we have recalibrated and added additional uh, categories where people can self-identify what they choose to be. And then we get on to words, and words matter, not because it's woke, but because it denotes respect, and also it is implicit within scientific precision that should underscore all the work that we do. This is a great article from the BMJ by Kamlish Kumti. And it suggests that we need to move away from the narrative of black, Asian, and minority ethnic community, or BME, to focusing on ethnically diverse communities or minoritized communities. Those are the two terms that I am now making use of within the literature and the manner in which I conduct research. So when we start thinking about minority groups, one can be physically part of a majority, but minoritized as a consequence of a dominant group that may be associated with power and superiority in terms of how they release that power to the wider society. It is associated with privilege. We then get on to another key finding from the review, which is around black box epidemiology. And this is often denoted as looking at a relationship between two variables, which may include race or ethnicity, but not really delving into the box to understand what is the causal mechanism between that relationship. 
The other facet associated with black box epidemiology is ethnicity is often included in research as a knee-jerk reaction. And if you look in the sociodemographic characteristics, in many of the initial tables and research studies, there's no suggestion about why that variable is being included in the research or how it's being incorporated within the analysis associated with those variables. It's really important that we improve on that. And then we come to the issue of intersectionality. And rather than seeing ethnicity as a standalone variable, we have to understand that it co-resides with other very important variables, for example, socioeconomic position, uh, indices of material deprivation, uh, gender, uh, sexual orientation, and so on. Each of those form constellations which are very important to unpick and understand the nuances that mean that certain variables are operating in particular ways. And for anyone who wants to understand this in more detail, I strongly suggest that you go to the work by Joanna Davis, who's based at King's College London. Another key finding within the work that we examined was the inclusion of minoritized communities within the research process. They are frequently underrepresented in clinical trials for a whole host of very important historic reasons, some associated with cultural mistrust of minoritized communities with the research process as a consequence of the reality that they were disavowed earlier on. The Tuskegee syphilis expense is a very good example. But there may be planned exclusion or inadvertent exclusion. So, for example, many of the pieces of work that I've done, which have made use of death registration certificates, have had to focus on first-generation migrants because ethnicity isn't currently recorded, or it is now as a consequence of the pandemic, in death registrations itself. Which meant that we missed out on second and third-generation migrants. They remained invisible. It's not just. There is the potential to cause harm in the manner in which we do research. People from minoritized communities have often portrayed as being less deserving of services, particularly in some of the North American research. And that's probably in part due to an assimilationist white agenda. It is important to understand that in certain countries, particularly in Europe, there may be some who repudiate the value of ethnicity as a variable when they are making use of epidemiological research as a consequence of what happened in the Second World War. There are other terms that we often make use of in research. And again, I have looked at my own work and seen examples of this myself in terms of phrases that we use, which we didn't consider in detail. For example, populations are hard to reach. They're difficult to engage with. And then again, we make use of the word marginalized. Against what? Against what community are we referring to? There's a kind of decentering from a white middle class perspective that we need to take on board. We frequently compare, and again, much of my work has done this in terms of comparing several ethnic groups or minoritized communities to a white population, to the British population, to the white majority population. You'll see this in lots of regression analyses or other comparisons. And there's a certain level of ethnocentricity with why we do that. But instead, there are suggestions that we refer to those individuals as being the reference group, the control group, the comparison group, in order to decenter and bring back the agenda to understanding differences that truly do make a difference. My old boss, Irene Higginson, used to tell me, Jonathan, stop admiring the panorama. Stop just focusing on exploring and seeing if there are differences. We've got to go to the next stage in terms of developing solutions that really make a difference to people's lives. And this is 
wantonly absent from a pad's care literature that has focused on minoritised communities in terms of devising solutions that focus on changing the quality of care that individuals from minorities communities might be in receipt of. We make suggestions about how we might change quality. Those suggestions are often ignored. Or if quality improvements are part and parcel of national agenda, for example, the ambitions document, there is again a wholesale failure to focus on the needs of people from minoritised communities and how those services might be delivered in slightly different ways. So, an indifference to quality. So, the first step in recognising a problem is there is one. We recognise there's a problem in the manner that research has focused its efforts on marginalised communities over the last period, and it's incumbent on us, it is incumbent on me, to change that narrative. So, we provide a charter, and these are tentative recommendations in light of a piece of work that we hope to do, which will devise a consensus statement on the back of a modified Delphi exercise. We argue that it's important that we focus on equity. Equity is paramount in terms of social justice, particularly at the end of life, and particularly on the back of our work that we discovered during the pandemic, where there are very important yet subtle difference between inequality and inequity. We have to focus on why we are justifying the classification of people of minoritised communities within the research that we do. Again, if we were focusing on a particular issue, for example, symptom clusters, we would define what we understand a symptom cluster to be. And yet, as authors, as researchers, we do not operationalise those terms in our research or justify why we're including them. We have to go further and understand the currency of intersectionality and how different variables intersect and form constellations which are fascinating in their own right. And yet, individually, their value may be slightly less. We have to optimise data quality. And this is something that Gemma Clark's going to talk about slightly later on. We are really poor at collecting data on mar marginalised or ethnically diverse communities. We're getting better at it, but the sheer absence of data associated with ethnically diverse communities is something that is really hampering our efforts to understand issues and then devise solutions that will make a difference. We need to decolonise research teams and the methods that we use. So, for example, we need to work much more proactively with people from minoritised communities in terms of ingesting their wealth of experience and ideas in patient and public involvement. We need to think carefully about the composition of our research teams and how we can capacity build people from minoritised communities so they become the research leaders of tomorrow. And we need to understand the social context and processes that, ex that influence experiences and outcomes of care. We have to do far more in terms of how we not only examine the panorama, but how we devise solutions in terms of interventions which are built in concert with the very people that we want to help. This notion of decolonising research is relatively new and it's certainly new in palliative care. It's an agenda that I think we can learn a tremendous amount from in terms of constructing questions that matter, developing methods that deliver the right answers, and then reporting those findings in a manner that, again, conveys precision and also respect. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to pass on to Gemma now. So hello everyone, uh, my name is Gemma Clark. I'm a senior research fellow at the University of Leeds and Marie Curie Hospice in Bradford. 
Um, and I'm going to be talking today about improving ethnicity data in palliative care and some very preliminary findings from um, a national clinical audit. So um, my talk today has got two parts. First of all, I'll talk about some findings from the Equitable Care for All Ethnicities audit. And then I'm going to be reflecting on those findings and talking about some recommendations for improving ethnicity data and what we've learned from the audit so far. So the Equitable Care for All Ethnicities audit uh, was led by King's College Hospital uh, in London and the senior author, Dr. Sabrina Badge, were there. So methodology. So the aim was to investigate the validity and consistency of recorded ethnic groups um, across palliative care relevant databases and using patient self definition uh, to check validity and consistency. So we recruited sites through Twitter, through APM, through word of mouth, and they were from UK-wide palliative care centres, including hospices, hospitals, and community services. So the method was an order, it wasn't research, and it collected anonymous data only. And that data was collected by the local site leads um, at their site on one day, a selected day in June this year. So the audit had two standards. Uh, number one, validity. Does the patient's ethnic um, group, self-defined ethnic group, match the health care record? And then number two, consistency. Is that um, recorded ethnicity um, the same across different healthcare databases? And we defined, um, we did self-defined eth ethnicity in two ways. Patients were asked to just describe their ethnicity in a free text way in any way that they wanted to. And then secondly, they were asked to choose from one of the ONS categories. So there were two measures of self-definition of ethnicity. So some overall very preliminary findings. So data was returned by 51 sites across the UK, and that amounted to data which was audited from 1,179 patients. Most of the sites were in England, 92%, uh, but there was at least one site in each of the four nations. And those sites themselves were asked to define their setting type. Um, so most were mixed settings, 35%, and that means more than one service, so hospice and community or hospital and community. So how many patients consented to participate? Um, as you can see, most patients did consent. 63% of patients um, agreed to take part and give their ethnicity. 21% of those, that's the red section, the sec second largest um, proportion, uh, the person auditing felt that the patient was too unwell or it was clinically inappropriate for, for them to ask about their ethnicity at this time. And then the third largest proportion, that was patients who didn't have the capacity to participate, so weren't able to give an ethnic group. So how did people self-define their ethnic group? Um, so these are the five categories based on the um, ONS categories. Um, as you can see, the majority of the patients who had capacity to give their ethnicity were in the white group. Um, that was 86%. Um, of those, 76% were in the UK white group, and then 14% were other white, including white Irish and Eastern European groups. The second largest group that we've got is uh, the Asian um, category, and that's 6%. And this was a very diverse cat category when you look at the free text self-definitions, including people from different South Asian communities and people from different East Asian communities as well. So this is the first measure of both validity and consistency. And this looks at all the databases audited across all sites. So some sites only looked at one database, but other sites looked at five databases. So this measures um, across all of those. And this measure also treats um, invalid recordings and missing recordings the same. So it's just a count of how many times a valid ethnic group is recorded across any record for that patient. So as you can see, most patients, 64%, uh, their whole record that was audited had a valid ethnic group. But the second largest proportion, which was around 20%, 20% um, of patients had zero valid ethnic groups recorded um, across their record. 
So for sites where it was just one database, they, this may just mean just one um, missing category in that database. However, I think it is worth noting that 20% of all the patients audited across their records had no valid ethnic groups. So this flips it around and looks at how many times a wrong group was recorded, an invalid recording. Um, and again, this treats validity and missing data is the same. So it's just a count of how many times the wrong group has been recorded. So 88% had no invalid recordings across all databases. But again, the second largest proportion at 6%, the whole record of that patient was a wrong group. It wasn't missing, it was the wrong group that was recorded. And again, for some sites that may just be one database, one wrong recording. For other sites, it could have been five databases. So this measure is perhaps a more fair measure. It looks just at the um, self-defined ethnic group and the primary clinical record. So sites were asked to define which is the primary database that you use in your clinical care that you would use to look up ethnicity. And then it compares self-defined ethnicity to that. So for that comparison, 72% um, of patients had a match between the self-definition and their primary clinical record. 8% was a mismatch, and then we've got around 20% where it was partial, unclassified, or not, not recorded. So this measure of consistency looks at matching between the primary database and the second database. It doesn't take account of validity, it's just is there a match between number one and number two? And it's only for sites that had two or more databases. So the majority, that's 64%, yes, there was a consistent match um, for the patient between one and two, and then around 3% were in the mismatch and the unclassified. So that's just matching, it's not validity. But what's interesting is, if you look at the, those that were a consistent match between the primary and the secondary record, how many of those were of the wrong group? So there were 19 invalid matches, around 7% in that group, and four were partial or unclassified. So it was half right or it was unclassifiable. It certainly wasn't the right group. So in total, 9% of those who have a consistently matching record were actually a match of the wrong ethnic group, not something they said. And this is significant because often the other audits of ethnicity have taken a primary data care, a primary the primary database looked at ethnicity in that and looked for matching and said that that's the measure of a good ethnicity data. But actually, when we ask the patients their ethnicity, we can say that even for those that are matching, there's something recorded there and there's two saying the same thing, that up to 9% of those are wrong. Well, potentially wrong. Or well, they were wrong in this audit. <laughs> so in summary, uh, we had data from 1,179 patients, 63% uh, consented and around 30% were too unwell or lacked the capacity to participate, which I think we might expect in a primary, in a palliative care population. 76% of those um, who did have the capacity to say their ethnic group were in the UK white group and 72% had a valid group, 8% were wrong. 64% had matching between two the two main databases, however up to 9% of those were actually matching the wrong group. So the next steps for the audit will be to look at these measures by ethnic group, which I've started, but I'm not gonna to present today because it's not finished. And then it will be the individual um, site reports. So moving on to some reflections. So this reflection is based upon an editorial I co-wrote earlier this year, um, published in BMJ, Supportive and Palliative Care. And along with the co-authors, I wrote these recommendations based upon the literature before I'd undertaken the review. Um, so I'm going to reflect now upon what I've learned from actually collecting data versus what I've, what I've recommended from the literature itself. So there are five recommendations and I'm going to go through them. So the first recommendation was the improvement of ethnic group categories. Um, so in the editorial, the literature showed that ethnicity research is far too simplistic, it hides intergroup, and it hides intergroup variability. The literature also showed that simplistic categories were a barrier to data collection. 
If people didn't see their ethnic group represented, then they wouldn't want to say their ethnic group. So what did we learn from ECHO? So yeah, this really rang true. The way of measuring ethnicity through asking people a self-definition plus the ONS category showed that there was a really broad diversity of ethnic groups within those main groups. And this was particularly the case in the Asian, black and mixed multiple categories, which were very broad definitions within that. Equally, it also showed that people not seeing themselves reflected in the categories did make data capture more challenging. In fact, some people stated um, that they were upset that their ethnic category wasn't reflected in the ONS, and this was written by the auditors in the additional notes. So there are several incidences of um, participants, um, people who are being audited, complaining about this, um, rightly complaining about this. And I think the number of partial matches as well, that someone's ethnic group could half match a category, um, shows that it's not really capturing the diversity of um, people's ethnic groups. However, I, I'm going to slightly contradict myself. I do actually think keeping the overall arching groups is useful for analysis. Um, particularly even the binary UK white group versus all other, um, and I particularly if it's self-defined. And I think this is a measure perhaps not of a, a true ethnic group, but of an understanding of who considers themselves part of a majority or who, has, who, who is permitted to consider themselves part of that majority and who considers themselves or is permitted has to consider themselves outside of that majority, if that makes sense. So I do think keeping the overall groups is useful for analysis, if it's self-defined. However, it's only a beginning to understand the complexity of the data. So any time that those overarching groups or binary measures are used for an analysis, there should be something more um, to understand the diversity. So the next recommendation was sensitive, proportionate, and timely data collection. So in the editorial, the literature showed that asking about ethnic identity at the point of care could provoke feelings of anxiety for some patients. It was also noted that palliative care patients may be very ill, so collecting data needed to be timely and sensitive. So reflections from ECHI. Yes, so the data did reflect this. Around 30% of patients um, could not give an ethnic group because they were either too unwell or they lacked the capacity to participate. However, it is unknown how many people were made to feel uncomfortable by this audit or how many were upset about being asked about their ethnic group at the point of care or how many were upset that they felt that their ethnic group was not reflected. And this was only an audit and I think that is a question for further research and understanding. That being said, there were 21 refusals um, three people who consented, but then when asked for their ethnic groups, stated that they did not believe in ethnicity. And then a further seven people who consented, but then gave an answer that was neither an ethnic group nor a religion. Um, so I think that can be seen as some form of refusal or protest in some way. And that amounts to around three to four percent of those uh, with capacity of the whole data set. So support for staff collecting data, this was the third recommendation. So the literature showed that staff were worried about time and resources if they were the ones who had to be auditing ethnicity data. Uh, some staff also felt unsure about how to ask and some staff were worried about perceptions of racism. So reflections from ECHI. So there were 10 instances of staff choosing the option, I did not feel comfortable asking about ethnicity. There might have been more staff feeling uncomfortable than that, and they simply put the, it was clinically inappropriate or too unwell option. Um, but there were only 10 instances, which is probably quite um, a large amount, but who did not feel comfortable to ask as part of this audit. There were also 56 instances of patients saying they did not understand the question when asked about ethnicity. And that burden would then fall upon the staff to explain ethnicity. Um, as part of this audit, we ask staff not to explain it and just to move on. However, should it come to, when it comes to real data collection, that burden would then fall upon the staff to explain what ethnicity is. So it shows that there is a time burden um, and a training need um, for staff collecting ethnicity data. So building public trust. The fourth recommendation was um, building public trust. The editorial showed that many patients do not trust that their data will be stored securely. And the editorial also pointed out that in the EU, many countries actually prohibit ethnicity data collection because it is considered so sensitive and could be politically dangerous. 
So reflections from ECHI. So this was um, an unknown audit. It's unknown whether the refusals were for reasons of trust um, or for other reasons, um, but there is that three to four percent of people who refused or had re refusing behaviour. So that's a question for further research. And the final recommendation from the editorial was the responsible and contextualised use of ethnic data. So the editorial reflected upon the misuses of ethnicity data, including cherry picking and taking data out of context. When ethnicity data is not located in its social, political and historical context, it can look like ethnicity itself is, is the problem and not a representation of the context surrounding it. So reflections from ECHI. So these are just some thoughts rather than reflections based on the data. Um, because it hasn't been written up into a context yet, but I, some things I wanted to note on this point. Um, so I wanted to note that ethnicity is only part of any question and part of any answer. People's answers about ethnicity will have depended upon, even what ethnic group they gave will have depended upon the timing, who asked them, and intersectional issues, including gender, sexuality, um, economic status. And in a way that, cherry picks data in itself, it's just what one person said at one time and another person, that same person at another time, if asked by a, a different auditor, could have given a different ethnic group. For example, if someone is of mixed and multiple groups in one circumstance, they may have given one ethnic group and in another, another. So that's something to think about when reflecting upon validity. Um, it's also worth noting that the intersectional factors should be kept in mind when interpreting data. So overall, um, is data good? Are data good? And I mean that both in the singular sense of data as a concept and plurality of data out there, because I know there's a debate over is data or are data. So Kranzberg's first law of technology is that technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. And by that, he meant that technology is only as impartial as the people and the society that create it and ethnicity data should be considered the same way. So in conclusion, there are arguments for and against collecting ethnicity data. It, ethnicity data has the potential to cause harm, it could be challenging, it can be misused, um, and it can be cherry-picked. However, collecting ethnicity data is the only way to measure racial and ethnic inequality and it can be used to hold um, both services and research to account. For example, the rates of validity in this study um, found by this audit bring into question even seminal pieces of research from ethnic data over the last two years. For example, COVID-19 outcomes research. But overall, what is important is that ethnicity data is good quality, using patient self-definition for validity, it's audited for consistency and collected in the least harmful way possible. And we need to keep improving this. Okay, thank you. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Zobia Islam. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Zobia Islam, and I'm the Deputy Lead for Research at Loros Hospice. And Loros is the Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland Hospice. Here we care for over 2,500 patients and their families. And a little bit of uh, detail now about our vision. So, our vision is a hospice that everyone with an incurable illness has a right to excellent care. And this should value and respect their uniqueness and their own choices. And people should be enabled to live and die with dignity, with appropriate and compassionate support for themselves and their loved ones. In terms of our demographics, around half of Leicester's population are from minoritized, ethnically diverse backgrounds and 28% of the population are born outside of the EU. Leicester's considered to be one of the UK's most diverse cities with 240 faith groups and more than 100 languages spoken by residents. In fact, according to research by the London School of Economics, 
Narborough Road in Leicester is the most multicultural street in the UK, with business owners from over 22 countries. So with this in mind, I just want to remind you of our ambitions for palliative and end-of-life care, our national framework for local action. In particular, uh, I want to just remind us of statement one, that each person is seen as an individual, that I and the people important to me have opportunities to have honest, informed and timely conversations, and to know that I might die soon. I am asked what matters most to me. And statement five, all staff are prepared to care. Wherever I am, health and care staff bring empathy, skills and expertise and give me competent, confident and compassionate care. So equity is about being fair and impartial. And for us, it's about finding out what do we need to do to be fair and impartial. It's also about justice, and justice is also about long-term equity. So you can see in this image here, the systemic barriers have been removed and everybody can see the game on an equal footing or equitable footing. So over the, the past um, seven years or so, uh, I've been undertaking a lot of research around ethically diverse communities, minoritized ethically diverse communities, um, and the reason being is, as Jonathan mentioned earlier, that we know that individuals from minoritised, ethically diverse communities are less likely to access palliative care services later and less often than the indigenous white British population. We also know that they are on the rece receiving end of far more aggressive and futile treatment when it comes to end-of-life care. And there's often misunderstanding or miscommunication about what do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation means. And we also know that from our own work and that of others that Jonathan mentioned earlier, that healthcare professionals often hold assumptions about somebody's culture, beliefs, um, and background and so forth, like we all do. We all have assumptions, don't we? But this ultimately has an impact on their confidence or, or lack of skills or knowledge when it comes to having end-of-life care planning conversations with those from minoritised groups that are unfamiliar to them. So we sought some funding from the National Institute of Health Research to conduct a 35-month qualitative study. The study was called the Thinking Ahead Study. Uh, it was exploring specifically the barriers and enablers to end-of-life care planning with ethnic diverse patients, their family and healthcare professionals. Now the study itself involved three different work streams. In work stream one, um, we asked healthcare professionals to identify patients who were from minoritised ethnic diverse backgrounds who were in their last year of life, so terminally ill patients. These patients were from Leicester, Leicestershire, Nottingham, uh, Nottinghamshire. They were the study sites. And we conducted longitudinal case studies with these patients. So we spoke to these patients, uh, their family caregivers and healthcare professionals involved in their care up to three times over a period of nine months to gain an understanding about how deterioration and dying, their, their, their experiences of deterioration and dying, and how healthcare professionals featured in their lives. Had they had end-of-life care planning discussions? Had they recognised they'd had end-of-life care planning discussions? What had gone well? What hadn't gone so well? We also interviewed uh, separate bereaved family carers, and these were individuals that had lost a, a family member, a relative, in the last three to 12 months. And these were unlinked to the uh, Workstream 1 case studies. And again, the individual, the deceased individual, would have been from a, a diverse ethnic uh, background. And we were asked, asking these individuals retrospectively the experiences of the deceased uh, family member in terms of deterioration and dying. Had healthcare professionals featured in this? What had gone well about end of life care planning or what hadn't gone so well? So the data from the both separate work streams 
was analysed um, separately using a thematic approach to analysis and then triangulated. And during this triangulation, eight key themes emerged. Working with a professional storyteller and writer, we then developed eight stories, fictionalised stories, but very much based on the, uh, the real life cases and interviews. And these eight stories were presented to 50 stakeholders, and the stakeholders included healthcare professionals, educators, academics, um, as well as lay people and faith and community leaders. And we were asking these individuals in, in a workshop type scenario, how could we utilize these stories to develop resources for healthcare professionals that would help them, upskill them, provide them with the, with the skills that they needed to have conversations about end of life care, end of life care planning in a prey that was appropriate and acceptable to that individual family and their family members. So I now want to talk a little bit about one of the key findings from the study. Now, the findings really resonate with a, a Zulu greeting called Salbona. And Salbona literally means, I see you. But it's more than words of just seeing the person, it's about seeing the whole person. I see you in terms of your culture, your, your religion, your faith, your background. I see the whole you. And this is what patients and their families are telling us that health care professionals need to do. They need to see the whole person. So I, I now want to just play um, a bit of a film for you. And this film uh, highlights some of the key findings from um, the project. And you'll hear a number of uh, quotes that are the very real uh, life quotes from the case studies and the interviews with, with family members uh, as well, the bereaved family carers. Uh, so I'm going to play that for you now. Sobona is a Zulu greeting which means I see you. Patients and their families want to feel seen, known and heard. And to do that, we must respect their personal, cultural and faith beliefs. But what we found is that the health profession does not understand and are not able to understand that the real differences in how to approach our care and our needs, that is a key thing. How does one begin? Where does one begin with that? It's really important carers and caregivers and professionals understand exactly what, what it means from a spiritual and cultural aspect, understand what a, a Muslim person is, or what a Jehovah's Witness might need, or a Rastafarian, or somebody from the, the African community, or the West Indian community, or from the Chinese community, from the Irish traveller community, where, wherever it might be. To be culturally sensitive, to be sensitive to her background, her religion. I guess just checking with the family to see if it's okay. If they do want to do something, is it okay? But to be aware of her dietary needs, her modesty, to be aware of her scripture needs. So they really need to look at the notes, find the information. You know, I have a small group of people that know about me and know about your circumstances. Know about what treatment we can give you and what the outcome could be. To help healthcare professionals implement our findings, we've developed an e-learning resource, helping you practice This is from the Thinking Ahead Loras Project. If you want to find out more, please contact us through the email below. So what this highlights for us is that all people desire personalised, compassionate and holistic care at the end of life. And the current framework for good palliative care supports this. However, healthcare professionals need additional skills to navigate complex, sensitive communication and inquire about aspects of people's lives that may be unfamiliar to them, such as their religion, their faith, their belief systems. It's also about understanding the particularities of somebody's experience. So if somebody has experienced racism or discrimination in the past, in a healthcare setting or elsewhere, that's ultimately gonna have an impact on how willing they are or wanting they are to have a discussion about ends of life care with healthcare professionals in the future. So healthcare professionals need to develop cultural intelligence. They also need to recognize that they hold assumptions. We all hold assumptions, but it's about developing authentic curiosity. So being able to ask that patient, that family member, what is it that I need to know about you to make 
your care the best as it possibly can be, but asking that in a way that's appropriate and acceptable for that individual, for that family. Now, to support healthcare professionals, we have developed um, an e-learning resource, which was mentioned at the end of that uh, short film. And I should have said that that film was very much done um, in partnership and co-production with our public and patient informants and also support from East Midlands Research Development Services. And that's one of the key things we, we need to look at going forward, and I'll talk a bit more about that shortly. But going back to our resources, there is the e-learning resource that was mentioned. There's also um, an e-learning guide, and these are all free resources. Um, the stories themselves, the eight stories that I mentioned, audio recordings of those stories are all available on the LORAS website. So the link for the, all these resources is on there. So please do access that if you can. So let's have a think a little bit about working with our communities and how we've done that so far. Now, working with our community connectors, um, which fantastic, three fantastic ladies who are real true community assets, we wanted to speak to individuals across the study sites, um, ethnically diverse, minoritized individuals, to gain an understanding of of what they thought about what a hospice is and the services they provide. What was their understanding of end of life and services that might be useful? Did they know what end of life care planning was? And had they heard of the respect form? Had they discussed planning ahead about their own and their family members end of life? And it was by working with these community assets, employing them, um, as community connectors, we were able to, or the, or the ladies, I should say, were able to hold uh, consultations with over 106 uh, individuals across those sites. So it probably won't surprise you to know, but the majority knew very little about what a hospice is, what end of life care is, what end of life care planning is, unless they'd actually had direct experience of a relative being terminally ill. Views about hospices and misunderstandings were shared in these group discussions. And any myths about hospices being a place where people were left to die without any food or water were discussed and corrected. There was also discussions around trust in health services um, and healthcare professionals as well. And I should have pointed out that these discussions were held just after the last lockdown. And there was a lot of discussion about COVID-19 and vaccines and so forth. So, you know, it was, it was a good opportunity to talk about any misgivings that people had and any misconceptions corrected. What we did know, what we found was that people did want the opportunity to visit a hospice. They wanted to know more about what the services were that we provide. They wanted to know more about what respect form was and they wanted more face-to-face -face discussion. They wanted information to be available in doctor's surgeries and libraries and places that they accessed. We were lucky enough to do a number of radio shows across multilingual radio stations across Leicester and Nottingham. And people had heard these radio shows and thought, yeah, you know, that was a really good way of disseminating some of your findings and just raising awareness about the services that are available on our doorstep. So they wanted more of this type of um, medium to disseminate information. And the young people, well, I should say young people, but there were, there were young people that, we, that were spoken to in these consultations were aged from 17, but then there were individuals all the way up to 70 plus that were within this 106 people. And young people uh, mentioned that they were quite often the ones that were accompanying relatives, family caregivers, to doctor's appointments, to consultations, but they didn't really know anything about palliative care or palliative care services. What was a hospice? Why wasn't this taught in schools? Why was not information made available online TikTok was mentioned, uh, an app was mentioned. Could this information be made available on, on some sort of an app? And others mentioned, particularly those that were involved with volunteering community groups and organizations, the benefits of having WhatsApp groups for sharing information. So there was a lot of learning for us taken forward. Now, in our aims to provide equity uh, in palliative care and to address some of the challenges and imperatives the research team at LORAS have instigated and convened a national forum called Sarborna 
Equity and Palliative Care for Research Forum. Now, the forum seeks to include academics, researchers, clinicians, and also researchers based within voluntary and community organisations, as well as public uh, patient involvement and engagement. Now, the forum was just convened this year uh, and ultimately wants to, it to enable and create opportunities for collaborative research with underserved communities, addressing health inequalities in palliative and end-of-life care, and also to develop guidance for researchers on community engagement and co-production and provide a supportive environment for early career researchers, particularly those from underserved groups. So we want to provide mentoring, training and networking events. And the objectives of the forum are to promote dissemination and impact of findings and provide a place to discuss and pull research previously undertaken and currently being undertaken and to identify research foci within the UK and provide a network to be called upon for consensus work, as well as share knowledge about innovations and good practice in care and education and research in the field. And it, this, the meetings for this uh, forum have all been conducted uh, virtually, so it's open to anybody that has an interest, and please do contact me uh, after the session if you would like to know more. And it's been lovely coming to Hospice UK uh, and seeing so many colleagues face-to-face, uh, -face because we haven't had the opportunity to meet each other face-to-face um, -face before today. I now want to talk a little bit about some of the work that we're doing um, within the hospice to explore uh, equity, uh, race equity in palliative care. So I've talked a little bit about young people and how young people have told us that they're quite often left out of these significant conversations about end of life care, end of life care planning. So a piece of work that we're currently undertaking is specifically with young people and working with a visual artist and a youth and community worker through the medium of art, we are exploring why dying matters, death and dying matters to young people. And these young people are from minoritized, uh, ethnically diverse groups. They're aged from predominantly from 13 to 25, although we have had younger people as well. And working with the visual artists, they are being asked, dying matters because, that's the question. And then working in groups, they are writing down why dying matters to them as individuals, members of a family and of a community, and also drawing images about why dying matters. The visual artist is then incorporating these images into uh, jigsaw puzzle pieces. And altogether, we're going to have around 24 jigsaw puzzle pieces, which are gonna form a piece of art or mural, which is gonna be displayed within Leicester. And the unveiling of that will be uh, next year. But this is a conversation starter. The young people that are coming to the workshops are having the opportunity to learn about what we do as a hospice, what palliative care services are. They're having the, the opportunity to discuss a really important and often quite a taboo subject within society. So it's creating an open door, if you like, to start the discussion about death and dying. Another project that we're will be undertaking in the new year uh, with support from Mary Curie uh, Impact Funding is work around interpreters in end of life care, particularly around equity in communication outcomes. And I've already talked about how clinicians report high levels of uncertainty um, when working with patients, but this is particularly when there's a language barrier. And we also know that personalised, culturally appropriate care planning relies on careful translation of sensitive messages, especially during discussion of preferences and imperatives at the end of life. It's only through effective communication can clinicians gain the trust of patients and families and elicit and demonstrate empathic respect for the person and their socio-cultural circumstances and values. Yet medical training and training of specialists in palliative care does not include theoretical or practical skills around how to manage consultations on end of life care when working with interpreters. So drawing on established partnerships and our proven experience in communication simulation training methods, we're going to convene workshops with education experts, um, interpreters and patient representatives to review practice and co-plan training resources for medical students and clinicians working in palliative care. 
and these will include online learning opportunities and guidance for trainers as well as in-person simulation sessions. So we're going to work with our established stakeholder network to develop a case to embed working with interpreters as a score, core skill that addresses inequity in care. So another project which is again starting in the new year is the crisis study. And here we really want to, to understand what the impact of COVID-19 pandemic has had on particularly vulnerable, minoritised, ethnically diverse patients with end-stage kidney disease. And these are individuals that are on an hemodialysis. So we want to know if COVID-19 and the fact that we know particularly vulnerable individuals, such as those with on hemodialysis, if they contract COVID-19 will essentially that will have an impact on their health and they may deteriorate. So we want to know if that has uh, had an impact on families, patients and healthcare professionals readiness or willingness to engage in conversations about end of life care and end of life care planning. And if there's any good practice that can be taken forward. So this work will lead to the development of education materials to support healthcare professionals to appropriately care for ethically diverse patients with end-stage kidney disease that are on hemodialysis. But it will also draw upon asset-based approach to develop and disseminate research findings to patients with end-stage kidney disease and their families within diverse, um, ethically diverse, minoritized community. So ultimately improving awareness of end-of-life care planning. So to summarize then, what our work and that of others actually that have spoken uh, at the conference um, in the past uh, couple of days, such as, for example, individuals at the Amplifying Community Voices session that I attended, is that the messenger is often as important or more important than the message. That is, communities need to hear information from people they trust. And their assets, their key assets, are these community connectors or community builders, as I've heard them being called as well. But it's about working in sustainable, equitable partnership with the community for the community. So it's about upskilling individuals, as Jonathan mentioned earlier, upskilling individuals that are then able to hold discussions with others from within their minoritized communities about how can we make palliative care, palliative care services more accessible and appropriate for you. So we know, don't we, that when it comes to achieving equity and justice in our care, we do have a long way to go. And what I've discussed today and what we've presented today are just some of the small steps in the start of our journey. Thank you for listening. So I think, thank you to three excellent uh, presentations. We've got time for a couple of questions. And the first one I'll go to is actually Joe, who I think was in response to your presentation, um, Gemma. And Joe is asking, how should we measure how effective hospice services are at meeting the needs of people from ethnically diverse groups? How should we measure how effective hospice services are at meeting the needs of people from ethnically diverse groups? Um, any measure of equality and whether we're looking at equality of outcome or equality of um, the opportunity and this reminds me of um, the, the paper that Sabrina wrote on the, the COVID-19 um, and that even though some, um, patients had been offered the same services they weren't getting the same equality of outcome so measurement around um, so Um, yeah, oh, that one works. So yeah, first of all, improving the data in the first place to be able to measure it, and then you need to look at how you're going to measure it. Anybody wish to add anything to that, Jonathan? I mean, I think there's a, 
a phrase for patient satisfaction as the ultimate validator of healthcare. We really need to focus on better approaches to understand experiences and outcomes. And that is critical. And it goes back to how are we constructing those questions? Are they, again, coming from a privileged ethnocentric narrative in terms of how we frame those questions and how we conceptualize quality? And then, very importantly, how are we making sense of that data? Thank you very much. Uh, the next question has come from Dr. Ezra Silvani. I'm not sure whether she's here, but she's part of the Cheshire Mersey Massive. I know that. Is she here? Hello, Ezra. We've never actually met. Um, uh, thank you for this excellent session, which I agree with. Are you aware of any work done about healthcare professionals themselves and why palliative care services are dominated by white ethnic groups? What are the barriers to this? Who would like to go first? There's a question. I am aware of an article that was published in BMJ Supports and Powers of Care. I think it might have been an editorial last year that focused on the proportion of clinicians working in the specialty from different ethnic groups. Um, it is small. We need to change that. Uh, the question is, how we go about making the specialty attractive, particularly when there is an absolute deficit of clinicians out there anywhere at the moment in terms of where we need to be going over the next period. Um, I think this raises really interesting questions. So it again, it doesn't always go back to a privileged white ethnocentric approach to how we deliver care at a critical moment in people's lives. So I think that door is left very much open about what we need to do about it. Anybody wish to add anything? Yeah, I remember, I remember that one study, but I don't think there is any work actually looking at the barriers and, um, yeah, the barriers and why it's that way, but there's that one um, article. Yeah, and just to say that there absolutely needs to be some work conducted about that same issue. So it's something that we will be taking back with us. Thank you. Apologies, we can't hear you. <laughs> Can we get a mic to this lady at all, please? I'm aware that if you go to the Royal College of Physicians, you can break it down by specialty and then by different variables, for example, ethnicity. I know I'm not aware that any kind of data exists for nurses. Exactly. Why? Go to the Royal College of Physicians. Yeah. They yeah. have it. I can share that with link with you after this meeting. But nothing exists for nurses or allied health and social care professionals, as far as I'm aware. No, that's right. Um, I think one of the questions is also why are they people not going into it? You know, in terms of the fact we've got a lot of you know international medical graduates now um, coming into medicine in this country, um, but they're not going into palliative care and the questions could include, you know, is that because when you come to train from another country that maybe they don't have specialist palliative care or because when people come here they're being brought into surgical specialties or GP, uh, is there still within cultures uh, a problem again? So my mother is from Jamaica, I've been doing palliative care forever, she was a nurse, she understands but she still culturally is against palliative care and what it stands for. So. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done amongst healthcare professionals to find out what, what the reasons are. The question is why are people not coming in? Is it not just because they're not seen, but there's probably a lot more to it? There's a hand up here at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm like mindful we're running over and I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> Conceptually, I think that boxes picture with equality and equity um, is a really interesting thing for me. And actually, palliative care people are the boxes. It's not boxes, it's people. 
And so when you lose people or you don't have people, there is no one to keep that up. So it's about investment in time. And actually it might not just be people, it might also be about cultural groups. Um, so if we think about compassionate communities and how they work, are we encouraging communities to start their own dialogue and narrative about what end of life care is? Is the construct of palliative care so, and I don't mean this in a negative way, so conceptually white British that actually we're not opening a dialogue about respect in the forum sense, a conversation about escalation and drawing lines that allows other cultures to get into it and then participate in that conversation. Sorry, a comment more than a reflection, no, but in there lies the opportunity. So I, I will have to wrap up. Um, because of the time. I have a question here from Debbie Talbot, which Jonathan, I'm going to ask you to have a look at after we've finished. I think we've all learned a new word today, which is sour boner, which I think is a, a, extremely powerful about is looking at everybody as an individual. So please extend your thanks to the panel because I think it's brought a, a lot of thoughts.